I've been flipping for five years. I'm going to be starting my sixth year of flipping my classes. I flipped at the high school level and the college level. How many of you are work at the college level? Okay. A couple of the models I'm going to be talking about I think will work well at the college level. Some of them are going to work also good at uh, K-12 in addition to that. Flip learning is basically where students watch and learn the basic material before they get to class, typically at home the night before. Sometimes it's the morning of. Or, in my case, sometimes it's during lunch. They're procrastinating. Imagine that students do that. But then you spend your class time with your students where they're trying to do the harder part of the learning, learning how to do the material rather than learning about the material. Where we're in lecture, you were really learning about the material in class, doing the easy part of the learning, and then being sent home to do the hard part of learning, typically without any resources. Most people that start the flip class start with the traditional flip classroom. Christian called it the basic model, where you're really just flipping the traditional homework in the traditional lecture and not really changing a whole lot else about your class. So you still have your students with the direct instruction, typically via video. Then they spend the class time doing, in my case, as a math teacher, those math questions. And then applying it and still taking your assessment in class. We at Byron High School, who have been in our department flipping for five years now, have developed a course Moodle site for each one of our courses. It might be taught by multiple teachers, but we have one course for each, or one Moodle course for each course that we have, where it contains our essential learner outcomes, our videos, our links to additional resources, our homework, our homework solutions, and so on. One of the things that we do is when we record our videos, we put all of our videos on YouTube. However, we don't want our students to go to YouTube to watch the videos because they're going to be distracted by all the side videos that come up. The guys in my Calc class, they're, if they're on YouTube watching me, they're going to watch, want to watch Bikini Calculus that comes up on the side versus learning from me. So what we do is we embed our YouTube videos right in Moodle on a separate web page so that students only have one place to go to access all the information for our courses and not being distracted by the other things that YouTube can offer. Now, Kristen talked a little bit about this, but some teachers are like, if I'm not lecturing, what do I do? Well, that's where you spend class time truly helping your students make deep sense of your material. For the most part, the traditional flipped learning is a bridge to more student-centered learning environments where the student is actively involved in the learning process. These are different types of flipped learning that have been occurring out there, and I'm going to talk to you about some of these. I have first-hand experience in the mastery learning and the peer instruction, and I'll talk briefly about some of these others. Mastery learning is where students, for the most part, are working at their own pace through the curriculum watching videos, taking notes, practicing and applying it, and then taking an assessment. Here's kind of a visual picture of what the flip learning uh, mastery approach looks like. You start in the upper left-hand corner by watching the video and taking notes and encouraging your students to take notes, trying to get them actively involved in the learning process. Then they are practicing and applying it in class where Either fellow students are there to answer their questions, and you're there to assist them. Then they go ahead and do their mastery checks, which is a relatively short quiz over that lesson. If they're successful with that mastery check, they move on to the next topic and repeat the cycle. If they score less than 80% on that mastery check, they take a little detour, try to relearn that material, Take the mastery check again. If they're successful, they move on. If not, they go back there. If after the second time they're, they've taken the mastery check and haven't been successful, that's where you as a teacher need to intervene and work with that student one-on-one. -on -one. one of the key parts with the mastery environment, 
are these mastery checks. They can easily be done in Moodle. And if you do that with your Moodle quizzes, it simplifies your classroom. Some teachers aren't as comfortable with Moodle, so they use paper pencil quizzes. Either one works just fine, but one of the things you need to keep in mind is it needs to be short and effective. Typically four, maybe five questions at the most. One of the problems that students or teachers often run into in a mastery environment is a line of students waiting to talk to them. Either to get a mastery check, or waiting for you to grade the mastery check, or get feedback on the mastery check, or they just need help understanding the material and want your input. So as a teacher, you need to go ahead and devise a system within your classroom and how it operates to avoid this line. Because if students are standing in line, they're wasting their time. Another thing, if you're dealing with mastery, is you need to think about the physical makeup of your room. You need to have an area in your room where students can work together in groups or as an individual if they want to be able to learn the material. But you need to have a totally separate area of your room set up for assessments and where they're doing those mastery checks. So you've got to think about that physical setup. The second iteration of the Flip Classroom for uh, Ramsey Musolam was this idea of the explore, flip, and apply. Students go ahead and get a basic understanding of the material by exploring it and playing with it themselves before they receive any formal direct instruction from you, the teacher. And that's the flip part. Videos in the explore, flip, and apply are typically shorter and over very specific topics so that students who are missing some information from the explore phase can just watch those individual lessons or videos to help them get a good solid foundation. Then after more practice and inquiry, then they move on to the apply stage, which is typically some type of an assessment. Could be a project, could be a writing assignment, something along that lines. Another example of the flip class in flip learning is problem-based learning. Sometimes people use this also for problem-based learning. For the most part, it's another way where you're not necessarily front-loading the material or students with the material to be able to learn what's going on. Imagine a student trying to learn how to build a fuel cell. And they get to a spot where they're like, OK, how am I always getting so much more of this one element out of my fuel cell when I'm running it? And they get to a point where they need to learn how to balance chemical equations. So then they go from the creating phase back down to the learn basic knowledge phase by watching a video on balancing chemical equations. Then they can go back, after they've learned that, to creating again with the problem-based learning approach. Then there's gamification. Some of you were here this morning and had us listen to the session about gamification. For the most part, it's taking the flip mastery level, one step beyond that, and adding elements of the badges into that system to create the gamification. You can easily do that with Moodle by adding badge systems and restricting access and so on. If you're interested in learning more about it, I'm not an expert at it. You can talk to Stephen from this morning, or you can scan this QR code. It'll take you to a blog that tells you a lot more about the gamification and using those techniques in class. My second iteration of the Flip Classroom was peer instruction. Peer instruction was started by Eric Mazur in the early 90s. He's a Harvard physics professor. I think peer instruction works great at the upper level high school and works great at college if you are a college person. For the most part, it still involves students learning the basic material outside of class. And then in class, they're asked a series of conceptual questions. And then they try to convince their peers. Eric Mazur says education is a two-step process. First, the transfer of that information. Secondly, it's the assimilation of that information. And as staff, staff and faculty, we need to make ourselves available to help students with the assimilation. Because after all, information is everywhere. It's that assimilation that's the hard part of learning. That's where you're trying to make deep sense of it. Why not be in the room with the expert that can help you with that? That's the idea of the flip part. 
for the most part, students walk into the room, they're given a multiple choice question. They answer it on their own, referring to their notes, which encourages them to take notes, and they guess if they need to. Then they start discussing it with each other. Sometimes it's not a discussion, sometimes it's an argument or a debate. And then we repeat this process. Now here's more a graphic I made of more of a breakdown in detail of what it is. You pose your question, and for me, the first question is always on the board when they walk in class. They think, refer to their notes. During the yellow, they're not talking to anybody. There shouldn't be any conversation. Then they commit to their answer after they've had time to think about it. And then they share it with the teacher. Then they start discussing it. Sometimes arguing, sometimes debating. Sometimes it's extremely passionate people really getting into it here. But I love hearing the higher level thinking that goes on here and hearing their discussions. Hopefully they've been able to convince their neighbor what the right answer is and why. The person with the right answer typically made that leap from not understanding to understanding within the last 24 hours. They remember in detail what it took to get over that gap of not understanding. For me, that happened decades ago. I don't remember. But they're able to go ahead and help their peers over that gap of not understanding. And then they share the answer with the teacher again. We're going to try it. Hopefully we have time. We're going to try peer instruction with you. So I'm going to pose a question. You can't talk to anybody. No Googling. Sorry. Most of you know that metal expands when it's heated. So let's answer this question. This plate's heated uniformly. It's going to expand. Will the radius of the hole expand, stay the same, or decrease? And we're going to make this a little bit shorter than I would really like just for the sake of time. So take some time to really think about it here. If we had more time, I'd allow you to think more. But for the sake of time, one finger up if your answer is A. We're going to go old school on this. Two fingers up if your answer is B. Three fingers up if your answer is C. Look around. See if you can find somebody that has a different answer with you. Engage. Try to figure out who's right. Try to persuade them that you're right. By the way, for the sake of time, we're going to go ahead and continue on. I would love to take more time to get really great discussions and all that, but because I was only given 30 minutes, we need to go ahead and move on. Now, when you're looking at these, we're having people go ahead and respond initially with their answer, and ideally we want 50% of the people to have the correct answer the first time. However, that typically doesn't happen. You often want to have anywhere between 30 to 70% with a correct the first time. In that range, you can have great discussions. However, I'm assuming most of you are like, he's not going to tell us the answer? Or what is the right answer? Well, you guys are emotionally hooked in the learning process. For those of you that are maybe college professors, how often are your students emotionally hooked in the learning process? <laughs> so, what is the correct answer? Radius of the hole will increase. There's two common ways to think about this. As the plate is heated, it's going to expand in the length and the width proportionally. So therefore, the hole has to expand in the same proportions. A second way to think about it, there's a finite number of molecules going around the inside of this hole. There's space between all of them. You provide heat. They start vibrating faster, increasing that space in between each other. 
If the space increases between this finite number of molecules here, it's got to get a bigger circumference, causing your radius to increase. Now, I've used the peer instruction model for three years. So I'm going to share with you some of the data that I've collected that supports that this model does work. At the high school level, I've taught my calc, my pre-calc, and my algebra 2 in three forms. With lecture, the traditional flipped in the peer instruction. By the way, I'm missing this one over here because I had a year-long student intern. I didn't think I could use his data during this. Um, but you can see that the peer instruction approach in green outperforms all the other models. And what we're looking at here is the number of students that were proficient. The percent of students that were at 80% or above on all the assessments that were given. The peer instruction model outperformed all the others that I had. At my Augsburg College, Augsburg is just across the street from the university here, I teach the, a stats class. And here I was looking at end of course grades. With my lecture it was here. After I flipped and did the peer instruction, it rose by 5.5%. In addition to that, 100% of my students in my college class, and by the way, most of them were full-time working as a nurse, all adult learners, average age about 45, with high math anxiety. They wanted to avoid me, but I was a roadblock for most of them to be able to get into their master's program. So it's not a class that they wanted to take. They had to take. But 100% of those students found the peer instruction model a lot more effective than lecture. And they would prefer that at all their classes. Also back at the high school level, when we're comparing our failure rates in geometry with the peer instruction model, they're cut in half. Now I want to share with you some reflections about the flip class in general. The flip class allows you to be able to get to the higher levels of Bloom's taxonomy and the harder levels in class where the students have you as a resource. They can do the lower level parts here at home where they're learning about the material and have you and your, their classmates to do the hard part of learning to help them out. Flip learning is an idea. But there's multiple ways to implement flipped learning in your classroom, as you have seen. And even within my school, at one point we had four teachers in my math department doing peer instruction. We all implemented it slightly different to best fit the needs of our students and our style. You need to modify and adapt each one of these tools to fit you and your students. I love Moodle for the idea of a flipped classroom. It's, I can give my students one link of where they can go to get everything for my course. Whether it's my videos I make, my homework, my solutions, my links to additional resources, I love having access to Moodle for my students. Relationships in learning between the student and the teacher often allow students to be able to learn more and at a deeper level. But that takes time and many interactions. In a flipped environment, you have that time. You're working with students one-on-one -on -one the whole class period. With that time, you know you're connecting with students. When during the summer, you get emails from students and text messages from students just checking in on how you're doing and want to know what's going on with you. I had a student that said to me at the end of the school year, I've never had such a deep personal connection with a teacher before. And he contributed that to the idea of the flipped learning. Because instead of standing in front dispensing information, I was out there working one-on-one, -on -one, getting to know the individual students. And whether you're flipping or just using Moodle, I love this idea that learning's occurring 24-7, not just during class. Through looking at Moodle reports, I can see that students are accessing it at home, in the evenings, in the weekends and at night. I even have students accessing it between 2 and 5 in the morning when I think they should be sleeping. There's not necessarily a lot of people then, but still some. 
whenever you are implementing a change in your class, you want to make sure you're getting student buy-in. To get student buy-in, you want to explain to them ahead of time what the process is and why you're doing it. You want to guide your through students through the process and then use positive reinforcement to encourage them along. With the flipped classroom, videos are important, and our students love watching videos for entertainment online. They've been watching videos for years. However, watching a video for entertainment is totally different than watching a video for learning. So you need to model for your students in front of the class how to watch a video for learning, telling them how to engage in the video with pausing it and rewinding it and when and why to do that, and encouraging them to take notes. I share with my students this acronym. We have L for learning. Telling my students, be focused on the learning of the material rather than just getting the video done. And then being involved in the video by pausing, rewinding, and taking notes. The taking the notes is essential. And then being focused on the video. And for most of our students, to be focused on the video, that means they need to deal with the technology. They think they're great multitaskers, but when you focus on something, you can learn it at a much better uh, level. So for most of them, that means telling them to turn off their notifications, close extra apps, put their other devices away, maybe even turning their cell phone off, and then listening with headphones. This last one, you're going to probably have to repeat it multiple times throughout your class because they're going to forget that or purposely not remember it. Now, the fire hose effect. I've been dispensing a lot of information to you. With the flipped classroom, students can pause it, come back a half hour later or an hour later when their mind is fresh and able to take in more information. Students are treated as individuals in a flipped environment versus a number going through an assembly line. You also have more time in a flipped environment. More time with the students, but you often have more time in your curriculum where you can have more hands-on activities, more projects, more application problems. You also have more flexibility. Flexibility in your pacing, but students have flexibility on how and when to learn the material. One of the side notes that I love about the flipped classroom is if a student is gone, they can go ahead and log on and watch the lesson. And I don't have to go ahead and ignore the other 25 to 35 students in my room while I work with that student one-on-one -on -one to get them caught up. For the most part, a lot of my students who are gone come back already having watched the video and done the lesson. Another thing is, Listen to your students. They're going to give you valuable feedback on ways to change and improve your class. Another thing I think is very important is that you're always out and about with your students. A student's much more likely to ask you a question if you're just walking by or looking over their shoulder than they are if they have to get up out of their desk, walk in front of everybody, and go to you sitting by your desk. So be out and about with them all the time. I'm often asked, what does my class look like? It does not have straight rows. I allow my students to move their desks wherever they want. I don't really care what my class looks like as long as my students are working and focused on learning. I would encourage you to jump in and try something new. Try the flipped classroom if that's your area of interest. Questions at this point? Yes? Do we need a microphone for her? Thanks for a nice presentation. Did you ever use Lesson in Moodle? Use what? Something called Lesson. No, I have not. That's something you should try. OK. <laughs> it's fun. I also teach stats to adults who don't want to be there. Um, 
I'd been teaching online for a number of terms, and then I had the opportunity to teach in a face-to-face -face class, and I wanted to do the flipped classroom, and I jumped in with both feet, and my students said, what? And I said, no, no, really, it'll be great. And a couple of weeks later, they convinced me to drop it. Now, we only met once a week for three hours at a time, and same that may here. have been part of it. Okay, so you have the same thing. Yep. What my students told me was that they wanted me to be there when they were being introduced to the new ideas. They wanted, I guess I have a friendly face, they wanted like a personal introduction. And then we did all kinds of things like this. I don't lecture, but we, we did a lot of hands-on. I tried to get them to work on their weekly projects, but they really wanted me to be there for their first taste of each new topic. Um, do you have any advice for if I try this again? I didn't do the peer thing, so I could try that. Okay. I started off my first class with, I'd say, a, a half hour lecture of explaining what the flip class is, why it's helpful, and letting them know that there, I was there to help them learn and to help them learn it at a deeper level through that, I guess, face-to-face -face interaction where they can learn the basic material, basic understanding through the video, and we can do the harder part of learning in class together. And so that's kind of the way I approached it. And I could share my presentation I went through with you if you wanted. Um, for those of you that are watching online, she had said she had tried that approach for several weeks, but the students still kind of resisted and gave her uh, the desire that they wanted her to be there when it was first introduced. Do you ever insert engagement activities with your videos online? Um, I think that's where, kind of where the lesson question was going. Like, do you have? students watching the video and completing an activity that makes them engage with it, or is it just the video presentation and come to class? I have not. I do know that some teachers that do. And there's different ways, relatively easy ways, to make your videos more interactive, even if they are still just a 10-minute video. There's ways to be able to get questions inserted periodically, yes. And I think that's a good way to be able to engage your students. Um, but I have not done that. But there are several ways to do that, with or without Moodle. When you're working with the peer instruction, do you find any problems with, uh, let's say, some of our more vulnerable students who consistently are wrong with their first choice and then let them get that down? I guess I let my students know that there's no penalty for making mistakes. And when you are having them discuss in a one-on-one -on -one or a small group setting, they're not as concerned that they have a wrong answer. They would be a lot more concerned if you pointed them out or had them up in front of all that. But in a small group environment, I've not seen that that's uh, worked negatively. But I have had some students that really struggle, but it's during that discussion time that the light bulbs go on and they really uh, find that helpful. There's a question up also up front here, and I'm not sure what the time frame is here. We're doing okay. Let's, we can get the questions answered. Okay. Uh, thank you. One of the questions I had was, um, I guess for the peer activities when they're working in groups, were they doing um, individual assessment before they were going into the groups to kind of gain a mastery level, or do they kind of just go right into it and then the second question I have is, um, and I think you addressed this during your presentation, but if there were students that didn't view the material beforehand, um, what do you do, I guess, during the class to help bring those students up to speed? Are you referring to, I guess, my college experience or my high school experience? Probably your college. Okay. Um, at the college level, with my adult learners, I'm like, if you didn't come prepared, that's your issue. You can always go back and watch the videos again. But even if they didn't come prepared, and almost all of them did, they could always still learn quite a bit just from listening to the conversations that their peers are having. 
And you had two questions, and I forgot the other. Uh, the, the first one was mainly, are they doing something um, before they go into the peer-to-peer -peer setting, um, answering questions where they have practice to gain mastery in that? Uh, no practice with the mastery. With my college level, I typically put uh, about three questions up on the board at once, most of the time multiple choice, occasionally a free response. They try to answer it themselves, all three, just by referring to their notes, and then pretty much and everybody's done with all three, then they start engaging with each other. And then after they've engaged with each other, kind of come to an agreement on what the answer is, then I'll go over what the correct answer is and why and some common misconceptions that students have. And some of that, how much I explain, will be based on what percent of the students got it right. If they all got it right, I'm not going to have much of an explanation. If only 70% got it right, I'm going to have a little bit more in-depth discussion with it, going over the questions or answers. I have a sort of follow-on uh, question. Do you find it uh, that you um, need to set the expectations of the students before you start flip learning if, if it's different to what they've experienced in the past so that um, be more successful? You definitely want to inform them of what you're planning on doing and why and the advantages of it. And at the high school level, I definitely set expectations that you have to watch it before class or you get to spend an extra half hour with me at a, in a given day. Um, at the college level, I just explain what it is, why we're doing it, the advantages of it, but I don't necessarily set any other expectations because my college students, being a middle of an adult uh, life and my class was kind of preventing them from reaching their career goal, they were motivated um, to put the effort in. Thanks. Any other questions? All right, great. Thank you, Troy.